Hello and welcome to the Harbor View. I'm Joe Colley. Have you noticed the newly installed Hingham Harbor history signs along the walking paths and public areas of the Inner Harbor? These signs stretch from Broad Cove to the Hingham Maritime Center. The idea is to convey what has happened at the harbor since 1635 and to provide a generational conversation starter, says Bruce McElhoney, a member of the Harbor Development Committee's subcommittee that's involved with bringing the project to reality. Each sign incorporates the town seal. They were funded by a Greenbush Historic Preservation Trust Grant awarded to the Harbor Development Committee and the Bathing Beach Trustees. The plan is for a total of between 10 to 15 weather-resistant signs to be installed leading up to Hingham's 400th anniversary in 2035. The overall project was a cooperative effort among various town boards and departments, the Historical Society, volunteers, and interns. Visit hingham-ma.gov forward slash Hingham Harbor for full details. If you haven't seen the signs yet, why not take a leisurely fall walk along the harbor front and experience them firsthand? Around 30,000 vehicles a day reach Main Street in Hingham, which has the traffic committee addressing safety requests from Hingham residents. A request to install a crosswalk was recently made for the area between 386 and 392 Main Street, connecting to Thompson Avenue. This is an area where middle school students wait for the bus and where children cross the street to get to Hingham Rec and the playing fields. The request was signed by 33 neighbors, most of them residents of Thompson Avenue and Main Street. Hingham High School students also crossed the street in that area. This request, as well as requests for other crosswalks at Old Country and Grenadier Road and Wampatuck Road are also under review by the selectmen. The Bathing Beach trustees gave an update on the construction work on the new Bathing Beach bathhouse at the recent Board of Selectmen meeting. The building features a deck, windows with mullions, touches of mahogany, red cedar shingles, a Dutch door, a takeout window, and handicap accessible restrooms that will be open during concession stand hours. There will also be an additional 35 parking spaces. The bathhouse is still scheduled to be open to the public next spring. Well, that season is upon us where we see crimson tides of cranberries floating on the bogs. We see them showing up on our supermarket shelves and eventually making their way into our kitchens. But the question is, how do these cranberries make their way all the way to the consumer. Well, Brian Wick, Executive Director of the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association, is gonna give us an overview of how that all happens. So Brian, tell me about the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association. How long has it been an association? It's been around since 1888, which makes it one of the oldest farming organizations in the country. And we represent the interests of the Massachusetts cranberry growers, regardless of whether we're on Cape Cod or not. The, the name, has been around for a long time because the industry started on Cape Cod, but today only about 10% of the acreage is on the Cape, but the name has, has stuck. And roughly how many growers are in this association? About 300. And as an association, what exactly do you do for the individual growers and then as a, as a cooperative of growers? So there, it's a dues-based organization, so the growers voluntarily pay dues to become members. And we help represent their interests in a variety of ways. We help them with education, uh, making sure they're aware of regulations, how to comply. Uh, we find grant opportunities for them. Uh, we'll advocate for them at the national, local, or state level on various issues. And we do some public outreach as well to help keep cranberries top of mind amongst the consumers and constituents of Massachusetts, or, you know, the neighbors, and so that it can be very much part of the lifestyle of Southeastern Massachusetts, nestled with the cranberry bogs and the community. It's all kind of bundled together. So we try to make sure that our community is aware of the industry and the importance of it. My first after school job as a 13 year old was working on a cranberry bog in Duxbury, helping to carry on empty boxes and haul off the, uh, the boxes that were full of cranberries. 
at which at that time I think they call it as a dry harvest. Correct. How are cranberries harvested today? Is it strictly a dry and then a wet harvest or is it a variation of the two? There's both wet and dry harvest, but majority of it is wet. It's about 96% of the growers or the bogs are harvested wet. And that's what most people think of when they think of the wet harvest. The bogs are dry for most of the year. You know, a lot of people think that they're flooded all the time and they're not, they're just flooded twice a year in the winter to protect them and then the fall to harvest. So the wet harvest is the flooded fruit and it gets pumped off the bogs and that's used for most of the products, cranberry juice, sauce, uh, dried cranberries, any of those other forms. And then the dry harvested fruit is the fresh fruit that you'd see in stores and packages or farmers markets. And that's a very small percentage of the business today. The fruit well, up to the 1960s was all harvested dry. Uh, but it, it's completely changed now. And so now it's a very small part of the segment of the business. It's still a very important part and very nostalgic piece of it, uh, but it's a very small piece today. You know, I've got to tell you my first reaction, my initial reaction when I saw in the stores craisins. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by the fact that this is a dried cranberry. This is something that they used to discard. That is to say, it didn't really find its way to the marketplace. When did Craisins first come on, do you recall? So Craisin is the brand name for ocean sprays. So they're, they're sweet and dry cranberries is okay. what we call them in the industry because there's other manufacturers of them. And they uh, basically were invented in the late 90s and really started to become popular in the, in the early 2000s and have taken off to the point now where they are the driver of the industry. It, it was a juice first industry for a long time and now it's really this dried cranberry is, is, the, is the leading product of, of choice amongst the consumers throughout the world. And it was really an afterthought because they, in the 90s or, and prior to that, they would create the juice product and they would press the cranberry, get the juice out of it, and then they have this skin left over. And it was just a useless product at that point. Sometimes it was composted, they would give it to local farmers to use as, as feed, uh, but it was basically valueless. And so they, they worked on it and came up with the ability to get two uses out of that one cranberry. Press it for the juice and then turn it into this dried cranberry product where it gets infused back with, with, um, with a syrup mixture of, of juice and sweeteners and then it gets dried and it, it's you know that form I think most people are familiar with it. And so now today that's again we're still getting the two uses out of it but now it's almost the primary use seems to be for the the dry cranberry product, and now the byproducts become the juice. Still an extremely important part of the business, but it's interesting how over time it's, it's flipped a little bit. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges aside from maybe just dealing with how do you protect the cranberries from bugs and disease? There's, there's two major areas of research. There's horticultural research and health research. So I think you're getting more of the horticultural piece to understand the growing of the cranberries. And we're very fortunate to have the UMass Cranberry Station, which is in Wareham, and it's affiliated with, with the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And it's been around for over 100 years, it was formed in 1910. And they have PhD level scientists there and staff, and all they do is study cranberries. They have pathologists, entomologists, physiologists, you know, all the various ologists that you need to, to study a crop. And that's what they do, and they study things like the pests, the insect pests, and how can you better treat the pests and come up with new treatment options? Uh, how to identify a new pest? We, you know, new pests come into the area that maybe have been introduced, or or old pests that are making their way back in again. So growers might bring in a, some sort of bug or a weevil or something, and the cranberry station will identify it. And scale is one that's a, these little tiny little buggers, as I call them, um, that get on the plant. And they hadn't been around in decades. And then they started coming up again. And so the cranberry station was the one to figure out what these little insects were. They're called the scale and, and how to treat them and try to get ahead of it. And we do the same thing, or they do the same thing with the weeds of the bog. There's various types of weeds and diseases, the fungal pathogens that affect the fruit quality. And also the station then will help with other things such as water use. How can the growers use less water, use it more efficiently? Uh, nutrition, fine tuning your, your nutrient management plants, all those aspects come out of that cranberry station. 
So we wouldn't be where we are today as an industry and certainly with our growers growing the best quality fruit that they can in the most environmentally friendly way without having this partner of the University of Massachusetts with us. Um, and so it's, it's challenging doing this type of work because it's you're working in the environment. You're out in the cranberry bogs doing these experiments and figuring out these factors, but it's not controlled because you got mother nature. So it takes many years to develop these tools and techniques because you have to learn to have them be adaptable to the changing climate. And maybe you get a you know, rainstorm or some sort of weather event that completely follows up the experiment that you're just about to do. So you might have to wait another year to do it again, depending on how, what the impact was. So it takes many years to develop these, these techniques that the Cranberry Station has. Uh, so that's one of the challenges that we have. And cranberries is a very small piece of the agricultural pie. And if you look across all the different forms of agriculture in this country, cranberries are considered a specialty crop or a minor use crop. We're, you know, we're very small, about 40,000 acres in total of cranberries throughout the United States. And you could have one corn grower who has that many acres or more in, in Iowa alone. So we're very small. So we don't have as many of the resources that some of these other bigger crops do. So we're very fortunate to have this uh, university to help us. And the, the cost and the resources that are required is, is one of the biggest challenges that we have. And that's something that our association is always looking at to where can we find some additional funds for the university? Uh, can we find some grant opportunities for them? Can we help do a PR campaign with our growers to maybe raise some funds for a particular project, that sort of thing? That's part of the role that we have to try to get as much research as we can in, in the smallest window possible. Now, you recently had uh, the Cranberry Festival. Tell me about that. So that for many years, we had the, the Cranberry Festival, which was hosted by the AD Make Peace Company, the largest cranberry grower in the world. And they hosted it on their farm, one of their, their main headquarters farm in Wareham. And actually, they've stopped doing it. So last year was the last year that we had the Cranberry Festival. Uh, a lot of issues went into that, but you know, resources, uh, the, the changing industry. You know, we've had a lot of struggles right now economically in the industry. So they weren't able to, to keep it going on. Um, but prior to that, it had become this huge event for Southeast Massachusetts where on a nice sunny day, you could have 15, 20,000 people showing up to learn more about cranberries and see the harvest and all the other events that were going on with it. And it was a big opportunity for us to help showcase the industry and, and educate the consumers about the cranberry and help them to understand it. I, mean, I grew up a quarter mile from a cranberry bog, didn't know anything about it until I got into the business after graduating from college. And most of our consumers are the same way. The people who live around here, they might drive by Cranberry Bog and see it, but they don't really know what's going on or understand why, and there's so much to it, and it's hard to, to get that message out, so that's part of the role that we have with the associations to help educate people so they better understand it, know what's going on on that crop, and help them appreciate it a bit more, that it is a lot of work and a labor of love to get these cranberries to harvest. I once had seen a helicopter lifting some cranberries off, you know, crates of cranberries yes, off the bog. Right. How long have they been using helicopters to do this? They started using helicopters in, in the 80s, the, the mid to late 80s, I would say. Uh, and that's for the fresh fruit operation where they would pile up the, the cranberries into these bins and one bin would hold about, I think about 300 pounds of cranberries and they would stack it up three tall. So now you get about 900 plus pounds of cranberries plus the weight of the bins. And then the helicopter would come and lift those three bins up and drop it onto a flatbed truck. And then the truck gets filled up and it drives away. Now, prior to that was your method of, of harvest where you hand carried the bins off, smaller bins obviously, but carry the boxes of cranberries off the bogs. And if you're a smaller grower, you might still do that. They will, they'll carry them off in the, in, the, in the bags that they harvest them in and then dump them into another container. But for a, a larger fresh fruit operation, they'll use the helicopters, it's much faster because uh, it's all about getting that fruit off the bog before that evening sun drops down and then the dew sets in and now the, the wetness starts to cover the cranberries and that's when you have problems, which is why in Massachusetts, the fresh fruit has to be harvested dry. Because if the, you put wet fruit in those plastic bags, it just it starts to break down very quickly. Our rot levels are too high here. And they've experimented, the growers have experimented with dryers and picking the fruit wet and then trying to dry it. And you just can't get the humidity out of the berries and it's, it's just not 
efficient or cost effective. So the helicopters are a way to get that fruit off the bog very quickly and in large quantities. But it is, it is expensive. Those helicopters aren't cheap. I mean, they, they rent them, obviously. They don't own their own helicopters. But you know, the, that's one of the costs of harvesting cranberries. For a dry harvest operation, you know, the helicopter fees are, are pretty steep, plus all the additional labor that you have. And that's why you tend to see less fresh fruit operations. The costs are higher. And it's, um, they do get a, a premium for the fruit, so that, that helps balance that. But it's much more labor-intensive process. You know, we could do a whole show on the harvesting of cranberries, but it's, it is much more challenging. When we look at your growers, and I'm curious to know about those growers who might be second, third, or even fourth generation growers. Uh, oh, can you share six, with even. us a little bit about that? Yeah, so most of our growers are multi-generational. Mm -hmm. uh, the farms have been in the family for decades, or in some cases over a century. Some of our cranberry bogs are the same actual vine stock that were planted in the 1800s. You know, they're a perennial vine, so with proper care, and they will, they're there to stay. So many of our vines are that old, and the, and the growers are continuing to farm generation after generation, passing it on to the next, to the next group. Um, it's something that you know, our growers are very proud of, that, that family history, maintaining that family way of life and the, the farming uh, aspect. So it's, it's something that our growers are certainly very proud of. And it's, you know, it's pretty cool to talk to a grower that says that they're the fourth, fifth, or sixth generation. I mean, that just blows my mind. I mean, it's uh, quite unique uh, to have that ability. And they're farming the same land, the same bogs. And it's, it's pretty awesome to, to see that. When we look at the farmers as they bring their crop to market, who are we competing against when you're talking about cranberries that are grown in southeast Massachusetts versus perhaps coming in from Canada or wherever? Yeah, so it can get a little complicated. If you look on the, the big picture, you know, we like to say all cranberries are good and all the, you know, rising tide floats all boats. And that, that certainly is true. Um, but we certainly see our challenges with some of the fruit that's coming in from some of the other growing regions that don't necessarily have all the, the challenges that we might have here in Massachusetts. So we're considered the highest cost growing region. Our land costs, labor, taxes, you know, it's, it's a higher cost region here in Massachusetts as opposed to some of the other areas where cranberries grow and Quebec is one that comes to mind. Uh, that's a region that's probably doubled in size in the last 10 years or so. They've really increased their production dramatically. And they've been growing cranberries up there since probably the 1940s. And it's in the area between Montreal and Quebec City. And their costs are lower up there. Um, you know, they still have their challenges, certainly, but they can grow the fruit lower than we can here in Massachusetts. So uh, they have the opportunities of, of bringing that fruit down here and then competing with our growers on a cost basis and it can be challenging for some of our growers, particularly some of our fresh fruit growers who are you know, already on thin margins and they're, they're trying to stay competitive. And then you got this other fruit coming in and it's, you know, it's, it's business, it's capitalism, but it's, we certainly want to support our local growers as much as possible and, and hope that we can do whatever we can to give them a, a strong foothold so they don't lose that, that market that they have for their locally grown fruit. And when you talk about locally grown fruit? How do we recognize that it's locally grown? So we've just launched uh, a new logo this year and you'll, you'll start to see it in stores, but it's going to take some time for it to, to come about. But it's, it's a logo that says Massachusetts Cranberries and has an outline of the state of Massachusetts and, and three cranberries uh, placed in the middle of it. And that is an opportunity for any of our growers who wish to utilize that on their packaging when they have locally sourced cranberries in it, whether it's fresh fruit, or they could make a, a cranberry sauce or a jam or jelly, whatever it might happen to be, they have the opportunity to use this logo and put it on the packaging, and that distinguishes it as a locally grown sourced Massachusetts cranberries. Uh, again, it's just an opportunity to help celebrate our industry here in Massachusetts and support our local growers. If you choose to buy a cranberry product from another part of the country, it's a good product, and again, it's great for consumers to be enjoying their, their cranberries wherever they come from. But we certainly, when the opportunity strikes, if you're looking for that locally grown fruit, and supporting your local grower, your neighbor, now you have a way of identifying that fruit more easily. And now that we're coming upon the, the 
holidays of Thanksgiving, Christmas, mm -hmm. where cranberries are perhaps uh, at least the uh, the whole berry ever present on the minds of the consumer. Right. We'll see them showing up in the stores. Yes. Uh, so now one begins to think about the recipes. Mm -hmm. And as an association, uh, is the Cape Cod, Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association, do you promote recipes to the consumers out there? Yes. So we have quite a few recipes on our website. Okay. And then links to other websites as well that have cranberry recipes. But we've developed quite a few that we have in house. So we, we've done some videos on them. We have recipe cards that we give away at various public events that we go to. So recipes are a very big part of the use of cranberries because a lot of people just don't know what to do with a bag of fresh cranberries. I mean, it could be nothing more simpler than making cranberry sauce. It is so easy and I think it's so good. Um, but there's other things you can do with them as well. You can literally use them in any meal. You know, breakfast, you can make smoothies with them, throw them in your oatmeal, whether it's dried cranberries, if you want something a little bit sweeter because they are sweetened, or the whole fresh cranberries that have a little more tartness to them, certainly. Um, in your lunch, you can have them in your salads, uh, in dinner, certainly. So there's just a whole variety of ways to utilize the cranberries, and we want to help people understand that. Because in some of our public outreach events, we'd have people saying, well, how do I use this? What do I do with it? And they just, if you don't know, you don't know. So we're trying to make that a little bit easier for folks and help to think about it. It's kind of the, the joke with me when I go to family events or, or friend gatherings and I bring a dish or something, there's always a cranberry in it somewhere, somehow. And it's been kind of the joke, oh, well, how did you fit cranberries into this one? You know, but it's, it's part of who I am. And I like more consumers to, to have that because it's such a healthy fruit. You know, the good news is it's so naturally low in sugar but the bad news is it's low naturally in sugar, so it's tart, and a lot of people don't like that. But at its core, that, that fresh, raw cranberry, you, it's hard-pressed to find a fruit that is healthier to eat because of the low sugar, yet it's very high in antioxidants and vitamin C and the proanthocyanins. I mean, it's just loaded with, with minerals and, and goodness. So That's what makes it one of the superfoods. It is a superfruit, absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to tell us about the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association? I guess just that, that we're here as a resource when people have questions or concerns about what might be going on. We're a resource, go to our website. We have a lot of information on how cranberries grow and why the grower is doing what they're doing. The, the pumps go on in the middle of the night, not because they're trying to sneak something on, but because they're, they could be cooling the bogs down or watering and irrigating. You, you, it's much better to do it when the sun's not out because you don't lose it to evaporation. So this, they could be protecting for a frost event at night by turning their systems on. So things come up, use our, our, our association as a resource and, and certainly um, to try to think more often about the Kramer grower that's, that's in your backyard amongst your community here and think a little bit more about what they're doing, what they're going through. There's, you know, we didn't touch on the economics, but most of our growers are farming at a loss right now. Really? Yeah. How's that? The cost of growing the cranberries is more than what they're getting paid currently for the fruit by and large. And so that's for some of our growers, they've been in this situation for six or seven years. Others, it's been a little bit more recent. Um, but now we're at the point where virtually all of our growers are at that upside down point. And a lot of it has to do with the supply of cranberries coming from other parts of the world that are growing. Like, you know, Quebec, I mentioned, uh, Wisconsin is producing three times what we produce here in Massachusetts. And the demand for cranberries hasn't, come up, hasn't kept up with that supply. So it's classic economics, supply demand. So we're, we're working as an industry to try to <coughs> grow that demand. Mm -hmm. And that's worldwide demand, not just here in the United States and get that supply demand back into better alignment and that will help with the pricing that our growers get. So, you know, we're estimating that it could be three to five years or so to get back into a, a better financial footing. And we're hoping it's sooner, obviously. Um, and that's another part of what we're doing at the association is, is trying to find other avenues for our growers to be able to sustain their farm, other revenue opportunities or whatever we can do to help bring some programs or policies, um, whatever it might be that we can find to help our growers stay sustainable for the future. Yeah, it would really be helpful if that grower could, let's say, cultivate a side crop during those uh, lean times and still maintain a footprint in the cranberry growing right. business. Right. 
It could be ag tourism. Yes. That's growing in popularity, mm -hmm. which is one of the benefits of, of where we are. We have a lot of people around us, so they don't have to travel far to, to visit a cranberry bog and learn more about it and get that experience. So we have more growers looking into that. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that they can look at and consider. It's challenging because you, you, know, you know cranberries, you know how to grow them, and then to try to diversify and, and do these other pieces, it's, it's an expertise that maybe they don't have. It's maybe time that they don't have, the resources to do it. It's, it's challenging for sure. That's when you're growing a perennial wetland crop, you don't have a lot of options for other other fruits and vegetables to grow. Like, you know, growing a row crop, if pumpkins are doing well, then you grow your pumpkins and maybe maybe corn does better and you can switch out to corn. Cranberry growers don't have that option. It's pretty much cranberries or or nothing. But maybe on the surrounding land that they have, they can they can do something. Well, Brian, I've enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a few things that I uh, wasn't even aware of, uh, with, particularly with respect to uh, the struggles right now that we want to make sure that we protect our local cranberry growers. It's really great that we can look forward to seeing uh, the new logo uh, on the packaging in our stores because mm -hmm. I certainly want to support our local cranberry growers. Great. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, finding out more about the recipes that you're offering online. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just see how we can uh, build upon that. Of course, I love making my own cranberry sauce and I take a little bit of a of a, the Bobby Flav um, uh, variation of his, uh, his cranberry sauce with uh, Turkish figs. Oh, nice. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Excellent. So, I'm going to give that a try. Brian, again, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you. Good to see you. Oftentimes, we find ourselves operating with misperceptions about what senior centers are all about. Well, Hingham's got a new director of the senior center, Jennifer Young, and she's going to sit with us and explain to us what the senior centers are all about today and what her vision is for the future. Tell me, Jennifer, how long have you been director of the Hingham Senior Center? I have been with the center since the last week in March of this year um, when Barbara Farnsworth retired, uh, longtime director of about 15 years. So it's just been about six months that I've been there. And what got you interested to become the director? Was this something you're doing before in another locales? Well, it's actually, it's a, it's a long but interesting story. I um, actually worked on the other end of the age spectrum for several years working with families and children um, through mental health services. I worked for five years for a Head Start program in Brockton as a behavior specialist. So I was the um, person that was called in as extra support for you know, really young children that needed some social emotional support in the classrooms. Um, I did that for, as I said, five years, commuting from Plymouth to Brockton and saw the opportunity to take a position or apply rather for a position as a social worker for seniors at the Plymouth Council on Aging. Um, and I thought, you know, let's give this a shot. I worked with a lot of grandparents that were raising grandchildren uh, while I was in Brockton and thought that I had um, some niche expertise that I could offer to the Plymouth seniors. Um, so I applied for that position and I held that position for about six years before um, earning the director position, which I held for two prior to coming to Hingham. What's it like in terms of the activities that you are looking to coordinate here in Hingham? It's a bustling center. I think that um, there's, a, there's a, not only just a common misperception about aging and senior, which we can get to, uh, but I think that there's a misperception when you're looking at the facility from the outside um, we're located in the town hall building at 224 Central Street. And I think when you look at it, you just see the, the front of the building and it looks rather small. But if you walk through the door, there's just, there's a sense of, you know, community, um, established relationships, uh, a, just warmth and, and, and friends and it's bustling. Um, we're running programs 
in every square inch possible in that building. And we're turning over, um, you know, several programs a day. It's, um, it's a wonderful place to be. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the misperceptions, if you will, among our seniors, many of whom we, we think they just want to sit around and just watch TV. I think about aging. And I look young relatively to have this role. Um, I hear that quite often. You know, what do you know about seniors? Um, I think that the term senior um, is, it's not necessarily what people want to consider themselves. You know, you, you hit 60 and you don't think I'm a senior. I'm not old enough yet. You don't feel old enough. You don't look old enough. At what point are you? Is it the way that you look? Is it the way that you feel? Is it your life experience that makes you a senior? Um, so when we're looking at the misperception, and I have conversations all the time, you know, have you been into the center? I'm not old enough. Well, how old are you? I'm 65. You know, my mother goes there. My aunt goes there. The services and the programs that we have are not necessarily for people that feel like a senior. They are for people that want to be engaged and want to age healthy. They want to be educated. They want to be informed. They want to be around other people, um, their peers. So I think that this perception that to come to the center, you, you need to have a walker. You need to be frail. You need to be a widow. It's still to this day, it, it blows my mind when, when I hear those comments. Um, and I went through it in Plymouth as well. Um, I think when I left there, we had turned a huge corner, which I hope to bring to Hingham, where we were servicing people in their late 50s that had retired early or found that they were working part time and really still had so much more to give. So I hope to bring that sense to hang on. How does one become involved with the Senior Center? How do you become engaged in those activities offered by the Senior Center? It's as easy as coming in. Um, as I said, we're located at 224 Central Street. Um, we actually just extended hours of operation to start offering Tuesday evening programming, taking into consideration, you know, some of our younger seniors that may be taking care of their grandkids during the day or might still be working, but want to remain engaged in other ways. Uh, so we are open now on Tuesday evenings until 6.30, um, which, is, which is fantastic. So we've started offering some programs, we're building that up. Um, but on the other end, uh, if somebody is interested in learning more about us and what we do, uh, they're more than welcome to come in and speak with us. We print a monthly newsletter, uh, it's called the Central Times. And you can download it um, off of our town website directly, or you can go to OurSeniorCenter.com and in the search bar put in the Hingham um, Senior Center, and it will the newest edition will pop up before you can even get it in the mail. Um, we have a huge variety of programs. As I said, we are looking to provide services and outreach to people in their 50s all the way to their 100s. That's 50 years of interests that we're trying to engage. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful challenge to have. Uh, so we offer programs from yoga to knitting to lifelong learning, which are one time or one to four sessions on a particular subject that are always um, education and base. Um, so we have guest lecturers that come in um, for this series that's offered twice a year. We also have a congregate lunch that we offer twice a week. Uh, we have a monthly breakfast with guest speakers that are registered. And this month, um, it's always on the third Tuesday, we have Bob Ryan coming in, who was a former uh, sports reporter from the Boston Globe. Uh, so wonderful opportunities for people to come in. You don't have to be a member to come in. Uh, you can just come in, you take a tour, uh, meet some of the seniors that are there. Uh, we also offer volunteer opportunities for anybody in the community that even if they're still working, um, 
and they want to find a way to give back. So we try to be really creative with those opportunities. Uh, we just had uh, a woman who I'm so, so grateful for. She has volunteered to help us with the monthly newsletter. So if you've been receiving it regularly, you will see that it has a, a whole new look. And I, I can't thank Suzanne enough for, for coming in and offering her services. And she had been taking a ukulele class there. She had been a member for a long time and said, you know what? I, I have a skill set and I'm not ready to let go of it. Let me share this with you. Uh, so it's just a, a wonderful place to exchange ideas. And um, it's a real community. It's a real asset for Hingham. You know, when we look at our seniors, many of whom may be um, aging in place alone at home. Um, and the research is showing that, you know, they need to stay actively engaged and up to and including getting out and having uh, a group meal does wonders for the psyche. What are some of the challenges that you are looking at as you try to reach out and connect with some of our seniors who are living alone here in Hingham? Finding them, mm -hmm. locating those individuals that aren't reaching out. Um, if they're not engaging socially on their own, they don't have friends that can draw them in. So it really is a, it's a marketing challenge for us right now. Uh, this is a great platform, so I want to say thank you to you for having me on as a guest. Uh, it, it's been six months since I've been to the center, and this is the first opportunity that I've had to interview for local cable access, and it's a wonderful tool. Uh, we're working on increasing our presence on social media as well. Um, and I think, you know, that's not the only platform that's available. Uh, we are going to reach out to some of the local newspapers. It's, it's really about marketing and, and finding a way to reach that person. Um, we also find challenges with transportation, uh, particularly, you know, for some of the larger programs. Um, we do have three vehicles at the center, so we do provide transportation to medical appointments within a certain time frame, as well as for shopping, um, going to the pharmacy and things of those nature, uh, but also to come to the center. So it, it's not a huge barrier, but I think that the perception is that that's, that's an excuse not to go. Um, you know, we really are trying to reach out to, to find those individuals. Um, you know, and as you said, it can be a challenge as people are aging in place. And I think people need to realize or um, understand that people are living longer in retirement. And it, it's so important to come in and to seek out those social engagement opportunities and remain active because it does, it keeps your brain engaged. It keeps you healthier longer. Um, so I'm looking forward to, you know, creatively solving some of those problems. So we've talked about the goals. Mm -hmm. We talked about how one can get involved in the senior center as a volunteer, as well as just to partake of the services mm -hmm. offered. And as I understand it, you just walk right on in and take a tour. Absolutely. Just that easy. Just that easy. <laughs> And we talked about some of the activities and events that you're scheduling going forward, particularly uh, including now, is it Tuesday evening program offerings? We are working on filling the calendar for Tuesday evening programs. Okay. Uh, we also have an outreach coordinator that does provide some services. If people are interested in learning more about fuel assistance opportunities during the heating season that's coming up, um, if there's anybody that might be facing some food insecurities, uh, we can help with applying for subsidized assistance programs, um, as well as, you know, connecting people with resources to help them age in place out in the community. Um, through the holiday season, too, I'd like to mention that we work with um, AARP that has a tax assistance program whereby people that book an appointment can come in and it's not financially based. Um, and they can have their taxes filed for free. So that starts in February. I'd like to invite you to come back and visit with us regularly. You talked about getting the message out there and seizing upon any and all opportunities to use media 
to get that message out to our seniors, whether it's through social media, whether it's through our local community access channels themselves. So I want to give you that platform. And you just let us know how often you want to visit with us. Monthly. Monthly? <laughs> well, well, we can make that happen. I mean, I would like to think that, you know, that each and every month there's something going on that you'll want to feature, you'll want to highlight. You and I have had conversation about a project that is long overdue, which is the kind of how do we help our seniors become more aware of and protect themselves from various financial scams. You know, senior financial abuse is rampant. Um, it's perhaps one of the uh, embarrassing, quiet, you know, subjects that seniors don't want to admit that they've been scammed. But then when they find out that it happened to you and it happened to you, and next thing you know, they realize that it's happening to a number of them out there. And somehow, some way, they've got to figure out how do we collectively protect them from that. Mm. And so perhaps we do PSAs together. Perhaps we do scam alerts. We work closely with our uh, law enforcement. We work closely with our local financial institutions and senior center directors to figure out how do we bring this type of information, this valuable information available. I would love that opportunity. All right. We um, are working on putting together or possibly participating in what's called the triad program which brings together you know, the seniors, um, safety, law enforcement um, under a, a council whereby we uh, you know, would bring in the police chief, the fire chief, um, you know, senior services, and, and talk about programs that we can bring to the center or out to the community um, that speak to those opportunities that those are so crafty find to take advantage of seniors. Um, not just financial um, abuse, but talking about you know fire safety and one of my favorite programs um, that's offered through the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department is their outreach program, whereby they have a series of um, programs written specifically for this purpose. Um, talking about internet dating safety, right. so which you would think is a, a normal platform for somebody that's single, um, that's older, it's perhaps a widow, and it hasn't quite accepted that they're ready for the dating scene. It's a, it's a real easy way to sort of just see what's out there. You know, what are the possibilities? But it opens up a world of vulnerability um, for those that don't understand, you know, what is, what is phishing? Um, you know, what are all of these terms that they're hearing on the radio? And, is it okay for me to give my address to this gentleman who says he wants to send me flowers? You know, absolutely not. So I think it's really important to talk about these new um, scams that are out there. So, awesome, yeah. looking forward to it. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you for visiting with us. And again, looking forward to having you back again. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you.